Today I want to talk about arpeggios and specifically using dominant seventh arpeggios to solo over a blues. Uh, for me this is a really important skill to work on and it's something that's going to immediately make your solos sound more interesting. I remember when I first started playing seriously and it was all about scales and I would learn my scales, major, minor, mixolydian, pentatonics, all keys, all over the fretboard and yes that can be very useful but I started to find that when I was making music that scales were a little bit cumbersome and hard to get musical results with so I started thinking more in terms of triads and arpeggios and suddenly things started sounding a bit more musical. I'm going to start by doing a little 12 bar improvisation and I'm going to try and just restrict myself to dominant seventh arpeggios. I might occasionally sneak a minor third or two in there but essentially it's just going to be arpeggios. And uh, then I'm going to take you through my approach to using arpeggios. I'm going to tell you the fingerings that I use, the way I organize my arpeggios, and talk about some ways that you can turn them into actual music. I should say that I'm using the blues just as a convenient platform that everybody is familiar with to demonstrate these concepts. But the concept of using arpeggios to play over chord progressions can be used in just about any style of music. So it's a super important thing to get the hang of. <laughs> get started then and the basic concept here is a very simple one we're just going to be using dominant seventh arpeggios to play over each of the three chords in a 12 bar blues in A so over the one chord which is A7 we're using an A dominant seventh arpeggio over the four chord D7 it's a D dominant seventh arpeggio and over the five chord E7 it's a E dominant seventh arpeggio now what is a dominant seventh arpeggio well the theory stuff goes something like this we've got a major triad with a flattened seventh. So you've got a root, a third, a fifth, and then a minor seventh or a flattened seventh. So for an A dominant seventh arpeggio, the notes you're going to need are going to be the root note A, and then the third is C sharp. You've got E is the fifth, and G is the flattened seventh. And then the theory is the same on the other chords. So over a D7, the notes are D, F sharp, A, and C. And over an E7 chord, an E dominant seventh arpeggio, the notes are going to be E, G sharp, B and D. Now, the reason you might want to use this kind of arpeggio approach to improvisation is because you're able to really describe the sound of each of the chords as they go past, whether it's in a 12 bar blues or any other kind of chord progression. And you're able to play the changes and often that's a way of getting much better musical results than just noodling about with some scale that's kind of a, a vague one size fits all solution to improvising over a chord progression. Let's take a look at how we might map out some of this information on the guitar then. And there are lots of ways that we could do this. I think most of the time I tend to use the traditional five patterns caged approach. I think that's the most practical way of organizing this information most of the time. And let's do this with the A7 arpeggio and we're going to take you through the five different positions, the fingerings that I would use and one thing that I'd like to do is to associate each arpeggio fingering with its underlying chord shape. And for me that really helps establish the link between the chord and the notes within the chord. And it really helps when it comes to making music with these arpeggio shapes. So let's start with this chord shape here. We've got a A7 chord shape in the fifth position. It's just an A7 bar chord. And around that chord shape, I like to be able to see the notes of my A7 arpeggio. So remember the notes are A, C sharp, E and G. And then we can do those same notes an octave higher. And we can include this high A note as well. So that's my A7 chord and the associated arpeggio shape. Uh, you could call this the E form if you're thinking in caged terms. I would just tend to call this pattern one or position one of the arpeggio. So we've got the chord and then the arpeggio. 
arpeggio shape. And that's the practice drill that I would do. I'd actually play the chord shape and then play the arpeggio up and down and then maybe play the chord shape again as well. So you're really cementing that connection between those two things. So if we move up the fretboard into the next zone, we've got this chord shape here. It's another A7 chord. I've got frets 7, 9, 8 and 9 starting on the D string. And again, around that chord shape, I can see the notes of the arpeggio. That would look like this. And another really important thing here is to be aware of where the root notes are. And it's quite straightforward in pattern one where it just starts on the root note. That's the lowest note in the pattern. But in the other patterns, the root note isn't necessarily going to be the lowest note in the pattern. So again, one thing that I like to do when I'm practicing these shapes is to practice with some awareness of where the root note is. So often starting and finishing on the root note. So this is actually our lowest available root note in this pattern. So I'll start there to that C sharp, that's the highest note available in the arpeggio in this particular zone of the fretboard. Then I'll descend and I'll actually go down below the root to this C sharp here. That's the lowest note available to me in this particular fretboard zone. But then I'm going to go back up and finish on that root again. So I'm hearing it as an A7 arpeggio. Awareness of those root notes is super important and beyond that I think just awareness of the functions of all of the notes in the arpeggio so it's important to know where the roots are but it's also good to know when you're on the third when you're playing the fifth when you're on the flat seven and get used to how that sounds when you're playing it against the chord so let's move on to the next shape we've got the chord here so starting on the A string I've got frets 12 11 12 and then 10, it's kind of the C form shape. And my arpeggio would look like this. So once again, starting and finishing on that root note. E is my highest note. Going down as far as that C sharp, and then I like to come back up and finish on that root. The next shape looks like this. We've got our chord, which is a kind of A form, A7 bar chord shape, starting on the A string. We've got 12, 14, 12, and 14. And the arpeggio would look like this. And it got some slightly awkward stuff going on down here on the lower strings below this root node stretch over for that G note there and that kind of keeps you in position in this particular zone of the fretboard if you like you could play that G down at the 10th fret on the A string instead of at the 15th fret on the, the low E string that's an option with quite a few of these shapes you've got a few fingering variations which are possible these are the shapes that I use but feel free to experiment with some variations and see what works for you personally I like to try and keep each shape within a particular fretboard zone and not to stray too far diagonally up or down the fretboard. So the final pattern would look like this. We've got a chord shape. We're getting a little bit high up the neck here so we could just take that down an octave, down 12 frets. So again, we've got an A7 chord shape and I'm just using this one here, so frets 5, 4, 5 and 2 and then the arpeggio shape would look like this. So those are the five shapes. If you're not already familiar with those shapes then you're just going to need to do your homework and do the drills and get those under your fingers. They really are super useful. Now, when it comes to applying these arpeggios in a musical situation, 
One of the main advantages of being familiar with all five of those shapes is that in any given zone of the fretboard we're able to find any chord that we might be looking for without too much horizontal movement and that means that we're able to connect between the arpeggios in a smooth and a musical way. So let's see how that might work for a 12 bar blues in A and if we start in the fifth position with our one chord we've got our arpeggio shape like that. We change to the four chord and we can keep in the same position and use that arpeggio shape and again for the five chord just keeping in the same position. And that's going to mean that we can create smooth licks and melodies in the same position on the guitar without having to hunt horizontally for the notes that we might need. And you can of course do this in other places on the fretboard as well and I think it's an important first step to learn it in the fifth position but eventually you want to learn it all over the fretboard and I'm going to leave it up to you to figure this stuff out and to think through these arpeggio connections but just to give you one more example we could find those same arpeggios in the second position on the guitar just using some different forms of the arpeggios so for the one chord the A7 we might use this this form here the G form and then to this form for the four chord and then for the five chord so you can see that all of this stuff is right there under your fingers in any given position on the fretboard so we've got all of these arpeggio shapes and these are really just the raw materials that we're going to be working with here and this is where I think a lot of players get to this point and then they give up because they struggle to actually make music from these arpeggios. So that's the next thing you're going to want to work on. And I've got a few suggestions here. And I think the main thing is to be thinking about smooth connections between these arpeggios and to play melodically. And one thing you hear people doing a lot when they're trying to make music using arpeggios is it sounds like an exercise and when the chord changes they default to the root note and then just whiz up and down the arpeggios from the root note. So I've got an exercise here which is quite a common exercise. I've heard a lot of people do it, jazz players in particular work on this kind of thing. And it's all about getting used to smooth connections between the arpeggio shapes. So the idea here is we're going to be playing continuous eighth notes and we're going to be going up and down the relevant arpeggio and when the harmony changes you're going to want to change to the nearest note in the relevant arpeggio that you're playing over so this is probably easier for me to demonstrate than it is to explain so we're going to start off with our A7 arpeggio our one chord arpeggio and we've got a bar of that so that takes us to a G Harmony is changing to the four chord, we've got a quick change to a D7 and the nearest note in a D7 arpeggio, if I'm continuing ascending in the same direction, is going to be an A, which is the fifth of a D7 chord. So I'm going to play that A note, I'm going to continue going up with the D7 arpeggio until I hit this C. This is actually the highest note available to me in this particular arpeggio pattern. So there I'm going to ping back down that arpeggio shape. So um, as far as this F sharp note here. And then we're going to switch back to the one chord arpeggio. And again, connecting to the nearest note. So I'm descending and an E is going to be the nearest note in an A7 arpeggio. So I'm going to play that E and then continue down an A7 arpeggio and so on. So that's the basic idea. I hope it's making some kind of sense. Let me just play through a 12 bar chorus using continuous eighth notes and smooth arpeggio connections. I will tab all of this stuff out if I'm going a bit too quickly for you in this video. But that would sound like this.
So there we are, that's the basic idea. Still, of course, it sounds like an exercise, but we're just getting used to that idea of smoothly connecting to the next chord, which sounds much more melodic than just jumping back to the root note every time the chord changes. Another thing that I quite frequently do, particularly on a blues, is to include the minor third in these arpeggio shapes. And that just makes everything sound a bit more bluesy, I think. Uh, for me, it's the essence of the blues is that kind of ambiguity between major and minor. It's very common to play the minor third and then immediately follow that up with the major third. So if you've been practicing these arpeggio shapes, as I suggested, and you're aware of the functions of all of these notes, you'll know where the major thirds are. And then it's fairly straightforward just to play a note one fret below, and that's going to be your minor third. So let me just give you an example. If we've got this form one of the A7 arpeggio, we've got the root, there's our C sharp, that's the major third. So the minor third is just going to be here, the C, and then you can resolve that up to the major third. So. And then we've just got the same thing here in the next octave. We've got the major third, there is the C sharp, and right below that, you've got the minor third. So. So, actually sounds a little bit weird descending. Uh, I think that's just because our ear wants that minor third to go up to the major third that it doesn't work quite so well in reverse. So you don't necessarily have to practice that as a formal exercise going up and down. But I think at least you want to be aware of the location of those minor thirds and to be able to push them up to the major third when you're improvising. And then, of course, you can apply that to the other arpeggio shapes as well. So I'll leave you to explore those possibilities. So now let me take you through my introductory improvisation, just as a practical example of how you might deploy some of these arpeggios in a real musical situation. And I just sat down and figured out more or less what I was doing there. So I'm just going to take you through this lick by lick. Now, my opening lick was something like this. So we're on the one chord here, the A7, hammering into that major third, and then hitting the G, which is the, the flat seven. And then we've got the quick change to the D7. So I'm hitting the third of the chord, so, and then down to the root. And then we're going back to the one chord, Here again, I'm emphasizing the third, so in fact, the minor to the major third. So, and again, here that C to C sharp. Then we're heading to the four chord. So, here I'm thinking around this chord shape here, so the C form and emphasizing this C note here, that's the flat seven. I'm in fact just giving that a little bit of a bend. And once again, resolving to the major third of the chord that we're heading to. So sliding into the C sharp against the A7 chord. You can very strongly hear the chords changing, even if you're not actually playing the chords or you're just playing single note lines, you can hear the harmony in the choice of notes. And just a little double stop, again, coming from the arpeggio shape, it's a little tritone shape, so it's the third and the flat seven. And then we're heading to the five chord. So here I'm thinking out of this chord shape, so and I've got the flat seven here, and the flat seven is a good bending note because we can bend that up to the root. So I'm bending a D up to an E. And I'm coming down the arpeggio. And I'm in fact, connecting two patterns here. So that pattern, and I'm coming down into this pattern here so and then we're 
going to the four chord and we've got this and then we're back home to the one chord and we've got a little turnaround here and the harmony for this is just A7, D7, A7, E7 so I'm just hitting chord tones here so we've got root and the flat seven of the one chord heading the third of the D7 and then one chord I'm kind of just pulling the minor third up in the vague direction of the major third and finally hitting the major third of the five chord so So that's my little solo, let me put that together slowly for you. Two, three. Since you asked, the gear that I'm using today, the guitar is my Shergold Provocateur. Uh, this was given to me by Shergold last year. Uh, they were very nice people, there were no strings attached, no obligations. They just said, do you fancy using one of our guitars? If you like it, you can use it in one of your videos. So I kind of said, yes, please. And uh, it's a guitar that I'm still enjoying. I'm still picking it up from time to time. Uh, it's very comfortable to play. Uh, it sounds great, I think, particularly for kind of classic rock and blues stuff and I'm using the neck pickup today which is a P90 I and mean, both of the pickups in this guitar are Seymour Duncan's I'm not sure exactly which models and they both sound really good you've got quite a powerful bridge humbucker and then as I said a P90 in the neck I do like the sound of P90's I think they work really well for blues stuff the amp I'm using today is my Vox AC30 which is a 90's reissue AC30 in this rather fetching red colour scheme and the only pedal I'm using today is a Boss Blues Driver and I've had that pedal for a long time it's not a pedal I use loads but I thought I'd get it out today uh, it sounds really good I think it particularly seems to work with this guitar and amp combination I have found in the past that it doesn't work with everything it's got quite a fizzy top end which you need to be a little bit careful with but when you've got a slightly darker voiced guitar then it tends to work really really well let me give you some sounds then. So I'm running the AC30 quite clean today and relying on the blues driver for a bit of dirt. So this is just the guitar straight into the AC30. And then switching on the blues driver. That's it for this week's video. I hope you found it interesting and useful. I'm going to be tabbing out all of the material that I talked about in this video and I'll put that up on my Patreon page. So there'll be my arpeggio fingerings and associated chord types. I'll tab out my intro solo as well. I'll put the backing track up there. So if you're going to find that kind of stuff useful, then do check that out. You can pay what you like and get access to all of that material as well as tabs and backing tracks to my previous videos. Thanks a lot for watching. I shall see you next time. Cheerio.